have today, and what a wonderful way to start it. Thank you, Mary Kay. Yeah, Born to dance up the aisle, <laughs> or at least march, you know. <laughs> well, let us stand for opening prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise your name because you have lifted us from the miry clay who put our feet on the rock and established our lives. You have forgiven our sin and made us new creatures throughout our, well, by your Son. We worship you this morning with our hearts, our hands, our gifts, our voices. Help us help others to know you and feel the blessings you bestow on us all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I do need voices. <laughs> If you, O oh Lord, kept a secret a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, with us, there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are to be feared. O oh Lord, hear our God. God promises to hear our prayers and never forsake us. Trust that our cries to God are heard by Him, and that in the name of Jesus, reconciliation will happen. Let's take some time to cry out to God, asking for forgiveness, trusting that God is waiting to hear from you as we do so in silence and in our hearts. O oh Lord, we wait for you, our souls wait for you, and in your word we put our hope. Our souls wait for you, O Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning. 
more than watch them wait for the morning. O oh Lord, I hear our prayer and forgive us our sins, for we know that you there is mercy. In you there is hope. In you there is life. Hear our cries and grant us your grace in the name of your wisdom. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We have cried out to the Lord, and the Lord has heard our prayers. People of God, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with Him is full redemption. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and by His authority, I declare to you the complete forgiveness of your sins. Rejoice and be glad, for we have a God who loves us and wants to spend eternity with us. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. This reading is from the book of Amos, the sixth chapter. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. <clears throat> Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and, like David, invent for themselves instruments of music. <coughs> who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The next reading is from the book of Psalms, the 146th Psalm, to be read responsibly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in the Son of Man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, he went on his perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes to the blind, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners, he upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of, of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God will Zion to all generations. Praise the Lord. Here ends this reading. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel today is according to St. Luke in the 16th chapter. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at the gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his fingers in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. 
And beside all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, I sent, uh, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into his place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if, anyone, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We continue with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What I'd like for the children to come forward, please be seated. We're missing Lydia. <laughs> I went to a football game because we're in cheer. You went to, oh, that's right, you cheered at a football game. Yeah. Were they razzled, dazzled by your cheering? I didn't cheer no? uh, yesterday because it was my bye week. It was uh, your sister, bye week. Sisters did. Oh, sisters cheered. Sisters, they didn't have a bye week. I thought only teams had bye weeks. I know. No? Okay. <laughs> Here they come! Here's my toddler. There's a chair. Stay. 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 I got a funny baby. Yes, please. I am I apologize. Oh, Hi you guys. Alright. Well, how are you this morning? Yeah. Well I my whole thing was gonna start off with do you use the alarm clock? with a snooze button in the morning to wake you up. And then I'm rethinking the whole thing. I'm going, you guys at your age, your alarm clock is not this clock where you can press the snooze button. Their alarm clock is mom <laughs> and dad, right? And the dog. Whatever, so I'm going, Let's change this. Mom and Dad usually use this alarm clock and to wake it up, you know, where they use their phones and they hit the snooze button. But you guys, you guys, if I remember correctly, you guys have Mom and Dad. All right? 
So you, this is what happened when I was growing up. All right, mom or dad, mostly mom, would wake us up to get ready for school or whatever, right? <coughs> and then instead of hitting the snooze button like adults would, you would say, just five more minutes, mom, right? Five more minutes, right, Al? Five more minutes, and, if, and then you guys would get more sleep. Mom would say, kids, get ready. Get ready for school. And then you would go, just five more minutes. And so you go on for not another five minutes. Meanwhile, what mom is doing, she's probably downstairs in the kitchen, getting lunch ready, getting everything ready. But you guys are still in bed because you figured, Mom, you just hit the mom snooze button, didn't you? That was your mom snooze button. And you probably did that maybe one more time. Like Al, I remember him, he said what they did is just stick out their feet and kind of made it sound like on the floor that they were getting ready. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, well, how are you getting sleep like that? But that's what kids do, right? Well, maybe, Maybe it's nice to get that extra five minutes of sleep, right? You think, I'm getting five more minutes, right? Yeah. Five more minutes of sleep, five more minutes, right? But if you keep on ignoring mom, and you try to get that five minutes of sleep, right? Mm -hmm. you, may, you might be late, and you might do something like miss the bus, or miss an appointment or something, right? 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 You might miss the bus. Now the second problem is if you keep on ignoring mom, after a while you just don't hear that voice anymore, right? You just kind of do it, right? Well, did you know that God, he sometimes sounds a wake up button in us? He wakes us up. Did you know that? Did you know that God, what he does, he has a wake-up alarm in our hearts. All right? He speaks to our heart and he says, it's time to wake up and follow me. Now, some people, they keep on hitting that snooze button, right? The adult snooze button. They keep on hitting that button and they and say, no, Lord, not now, call me again a little bit later. And some people keep on hitting that snooze button so many times that they get to the point where they don't even hear God's voice in their heart anymore, right? And when they finally wake up, they find out that it's too late. It's too late. So that's what our Bible story is today. Do you want me to come up for you? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, that's what our Bible story is today. Okay. Now, the Bible says that when well, Jesus was telling this story, it's about a rich man, all right? And he wore the finest clothes, and he had big, rich, he had big mansion out there, lots of cars and everything like that. But there was a beggar that was outside of his gate, and he wanted, you know, he was hungry, and his body was full of sores. He's like a homeless man. You've seen them around, right? Mm -hmm. And he was kind of hoping that the rich man would take pity. Pity means feel sorry for him. And kind of give him scraps from his table. Or give him something, you know, that he might make life easier for him to feed him or something like that. But every day the rich man passed by that beggar, Lazarus, and he didn't even, he just kind of ignored him. Didn't even give him a thought. It came to a point 
where he just kind of almost didn't see Lazarus. Did you know that? He was there so much and he just didn't see that there was this man over there full of sores and hungry. That's sad, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But the Bible says that Lazarus, the beggar, he died. And he went to heaven. He went to heaven. That beggar died and he went to heaven. Now, the rich man, what happened to the rich man? He died. But he went to hell. He went to hell. And he looked up and he saw Lazarus up there in heaven with Abraham. And the rich man, he asked Abraham, could you let Lazarus dip his finger in the water and put it on my tongue, my burning tongue? But Abraham says, no. And he reminded that rich man that when he was on earth, how he enjoyed all the good things in life on earth, while Lazarus had nothing. That rich man didn't help Lazarus at all. So, the rich man asked Abraham to allow Lazarus to go back to earth and warn his five brothers so they won't end up in hell like him. But again, Abraham said, no. Well, that's the time that the rich man finally woke up and said, oh, I should have listened. I should have followed God. But it was too late, wasn't it? He was already, it was too late. So God is still sending us wake-up calls to people today. Did you know that? He's saying, follow me. Let us pray that they will listen to his voice and follow him before it's too late. Right? So let us pray. Father, May we never be guilty of hitting that snooze button saying, later, Lord. Instead, <coughs> let us rise up and follow you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you, girls. I'm going to stay. I know that She gave my sermon, so can I go now? <laughs> huh? <laughs> well, the reality of hell is something that Jesus spoke of quite a bit. His story of Lazarus and the rich men are particularly poignant here. Now, the word Lazarus... Two points here. Lazarus means God helps or has helped. So we've identified Lazarus by name and from the ancient text also what it meant. But then notice that the rich man has no name. He's only identified as the rich man. So God in our text is kind of encompassing all those who are not Lazarus to be the rich man. It's also that it's worth noting to, to those who he spoke, those that were there did not resist the idea of hell just kind of flowed naturally into the parable. This was indicating that these people were well aware of what hell is. No surprise. They heard of it from the witness of the prophets. They penned it from the Hebrew scriptures. 
Now, what seems to require correction is, is how we ended up in either heaven or hell after death. So Jesus made it clear that the rich as, and well regarded by the world had no means of a ticket to paradise. From the last half of the story where the rich man conversed with Abraham across this vast chasm, we learn that it is not the relative wealth or poverty that sends anyone to their eternal fate. Now you notice I've used the word fate. But whether they have had faith and repentance, ah, the key word, repentance before the word of God, that's what was important, not their station in life or their wealthy holdings, as it were. Lazarus lived a full life of misery here on earth. And to that end, he helped, or hoped, I should say, to avoid starvation. And we hear from the story that he did that by begging for scraps at the rich man's table. As long as he did it outside the gate, you know. It's. But it's not Lazarus' poverty that brought him to Abraham. <clears throat> now the words used here are from a Hebrew phrase, meaning heaven or the place where those who die in God's grace enjoy his loving presence forever. That's how it's defined in Hebrew. It's not the wealth of the rich man that sends him to the torment of Hades. Notice it didn't say wealthy from what? He didn't, you know, well, look at what I've got. Look at my big mansion. Look at my wealth, and my bank, etc., etc. None of that made any of, was not of importance at all. Whether they have heard the words of Moses and the prophets, abiding in that word by faith and repentance is what's important. The rich man specifically and intentionally disregarded the needs of the neighbors, which he had means to nourish. thought it was nice, I'm going to use this little clock idea, is that he kept hitting the snooze button. The snooze button of indifference. He had violated the law of God. He violated the law of God's love for the neighbors, which sent him to hell in his unbelief. He had no faith before God, wherewith to receive grace. The perfect law of love, he violated. That condemned him. While Jesus' story makes clear that human travel between heaven and hell is precluded by design. There does not, there, it seems to be an aspect of travel between heaven and earth, which is possible, though not common, which seems kind of out of place, but think about it. We have Elisha, and we have Moses. The Mount of Transfiguration. Aspect of travel. The rich man eventually begged Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead to preach to his family so that they would avoid the death sentence that he has in hell. Rather than telling him the request was impossible, Abraham instead noted that all people have the witness 
of God's word given to them as the means by which they could escape. I shudder to think those who don't listen to the word of God makes me sad. Abraham's word at the end of this story foreshadow what Jesus would have would later prove by his death and resurrection. That a heart which refuses to hear the word, the word of God proclaimed by his prophets, will continue to reject it regardless of the preacher who brings it. No matter who stands on a corner and prays the word of God or expresses the word of God or who stands up here and preaches the word of God, it's ignored. It's been approved across the nations. It's been true that those who would disregard the word of God through the Hebrew prophets would also disregard the word of God incarnate in Christ Jesus and the apostles that he sent after his resurrection to declare the saving gospel to every generation. It is the word of God which established the law by which we are accountable in every thought, Word and deed. We just prayed that in the Apostles' Creed, didn't we? Wow. Things done. Things left undone. And the gospel which declares our sins forgiven. For Jesus' sake. The word of God sets the terms of all existence for all time throughout the whole cosmos. That's everything. So that by all creatures will either be judged in unbelief according to that law or absolved by grace through faith in Jesus' gospel. These alone are the paths to heaven and hell. And every mortal shall walk one or the other. There's no in-between. Jesus' word gives a firm rebuke and a correction to our age. The 21st century where so many people have decided that hell is too horrible to believe. Ain't gonna do it. It's like a science fiction movie, but turn it off. The, pen, the potential of God's eternal judgment is also rebelled against. I don't want to believe it. Like the rich man in Jesus' story, awareness of eternal reality does not alter their existence. We entertain such unbelief or willful ignorance at our own great peril. Do we really think that by ignoring Jesus' words about heaven and hell that we can change their eternal reality? <clears throat> or perhaps the terms he was established by which men shall enter forever, either one or the other. Do we really think that if enough useless theologians, bishops, pastors, popular authors, or convention delegates get together and agree to ignore God's word. The unfaithfulness of men will make God unfaithful to his word. And do we really think that we do anyone a moral good by hiding the true word of God from them? 
so that the eternal reality of hell is obscured while catering to the momentary sensibilities. Could the devil have devised any greater draw from the human race into internal, infernal perdition? Satan's out there pitching this negative all the time. People to whom the word of God has been entrusted, they might hide it from those that they could actually save. That the church of the West has grown too weak need to speak clearly Regarding God's word of judgment and hell. I like that weak need. It reveals either a lack of faith on the part of the preachers to abide in the word of Jesus, or a profound lack of love for a dying world that could be saved by that word. Many times I've been stopped walking the halls of a hospital. And even by the doctors have been asked to pray with them. Actually pray for them. Because of what they see, the carnage that they see every single day. Now why we, while we feast sumptuously at the Lord's table, there are beggars lying at our gates. Starving, suffering with disease of spiritual malnutrition. Think about that. Spiritual malnutrition. Ouch. All the while we have the means to feed them as freely as the Lord has fed us. By the same word that is life to us all. It is no more an act of love and withholding warning a sinful person of their potential fate in hell than it is to withhold warning from a teenager playing in the middle of the freeway that his destination is the morgue. True love can never be parted from the truth. Just as saving faith can never be parted from love. And faith, truth, and love are come to us by the word of God's law and the gospel. And we know by that same word that God desires no one to go through a place of eternal fiery torment, but rather to come to a saving knowledge of the truth. Hell is real. Make no question. Hell is real. And the horrors of mankind's just fate is the judgment of those flames in what moved our God of love to send His only begotten Son in the flesh so that He can suffer and die for each of us. It is the vicarious atonement of Jesus alone that both satisfies God's life, his justice toward mankind, and our rebellion against the law. It provides for us the saving grace, which is our forgiveness, our eternal life and salvation. No man can avoid hell on his own any more than he can lead a perfect life in his body, soul, and mind for every second of every day. Nor can he be perfect as God is perfect. Like all fallen men, everyone has fallen short of the glory and righteousness of God. And everyone is in need of that gospel grace of Jesus to avoid the fate that we've earned. Hell is real, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is greater because the love of God is stronger than his judgment given new life. 
new life, hope to everyone who will hear his word, repent, and believe in him. The time to worry about hell is not after he leaves the world. Because by then, Jesus tells us that the eternal fate of the people has already been cast. The rich man learns that the hard way. It's too late. While the reality of hell should be sobering, even terrifying to the people of the world, they will willfully reject the word of their creator. It should hold no terror or fear for the people of God who abide in his word. For the incarnate word comes to seek and to save the lost. For he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that he might, have, he might be saved through him. Jesus' mission from the manger to the cross to that empty tomb was a rescue mission born of infinite divine love for every soul that has ever been and never will be. The mission of divine love has come to us today in the word of his everlasting gospel, promising to everyone who will believe and follow him by the cross of Christ, there is no condemnation for those who abide in Christ. Because it has been by his stripes that we have been healed. Rest your conscience in the same promise of God's word to you and carry that word forth into a suffering world which so desperately needs it. God calls on us to do that. To share that gospel and to love our neighbor as we would ourselves. Hell is real, but your almighty Savior is greater, and his saving love abides on all those who abide in him and his word. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you today in repentance. We realize that hell exists. We also realize that your grace, your mercy, and your love for us can save us from that fate. We come here today, as we do every Sunday, to worship you, to remember your words to us. And we surrender ourselves to you and that of only you can give us that survivorship through our repentance in the word of Jesus. Amen.
come once again to your altar. We provide these gifts from our hearts to provide for the necessities of this church, of our community as we can, but more so to honor you. All that we do, we do to be good stewards and good children of you. So we do this, Father, our giving, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, they had a supper in the upper room. And during that meal, Jesus took the bread, broke it, gave thanks, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat of this, do so in the remembrance of me. When the meal was complete, Jesus took the wine, and he said, This wine, after giving thanks, is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of this, do so in the remembrance of me. The table is set. Come and eat.
body of Christ broken. Having shared the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have done so in the remembrance of what he did for us on the cross. The good news for us is that we shall share of this again when he returns. Amen. Amen. today. Uh, we lost Marlene, who was Al's aunt, yesterday. So we'll be praying for her. And of course, she has a twin named Darlene. Uh, they're her and her husband, in, well, whose husband is in assisted living because of Alzheimer's. So we'll definitely lift the, the whole family up. 
Uh, Brad Owen is re in rehab following his stroke a week ago. Uh, we, we were praying for him last week, or at least two weeks ago, maybe. I'm not too sure. Okay, that's from, from Dick. <coughs> Recovery for Debbie. Debbie Zavidel from her surgery. I talked to her the other day. She's doing better. Mm -hmm. And according to Bill, she's on the mend, but it's slow, right? Yeah, trouble with surgery. It's never quick. Uh, we also want to lift Charlene's brother. Brother? Brother. Yeah. Brother. Uh, who is having issues. Cheryl's dad, who has been moving around, now he's in the hospital and they're struggling with him. He has to make decisions with his disease. And we have another Bob, Gary's brother, who is also struggling. He had to go back to the hospital for I said Robert, I keep doing that thing. Rod, Robert's gonna come and smack me. Roger, thank you. Well, with these people in mind, yes sir. Sorry, um, one more quick prayer request. Um, Sunday, um, our youngest Elena, she uh, had an allergic reaction. We believe it was to dairy. And uh, she went into anaphylactic shock. Uh -huh. um, by the time the paramedics got there, she maybe had 15 minutes. Mm. It was uh, it was extremely frightening, and um, uh, <laughs> it was a close call. Um, we're very close to morning. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just want to praise God and thank Him for for the the first responders who saved her life and for the. Uh, that my wife didn't listen to me and just drive her to the hospital when she first saw, when she saw the first signs because that would she wouldn't have made it. it was, uh, mm -hmm. My wife was smart enough to call nine one one and uh, and God was great enough to heal her. Well, praise so, God, I can think yeah. she's going to be okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, I got a call. I talked to my daughter yesterday, Susan. She's undergoing her second phase of chemo, only it's pill form instead of. Um, the, whatever they do, yeah, through the port. Um, she's got, I think, six more doses to take, and then they'll do the CT scan in order to perform the double mastectomy. So we continue. She was in good spirits yesterday. She was picking on me. That's just wrong. <laughs> but she's doing well. Well, with that, let us pray for all people of God. Heavenly Father, we, well, we come here with many struggles, many hurts, but we're not alone. We're not alone in the fact that we know that you're there, and we're also not alone in the struggles. Our nation, our world is struggling with many things. We lift them to you as we describe them, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. <clears throat> We have soothsayers, politicians, I don't know what you want to call them, who are telling us that if we don't do this or we don't do that, we're going to have uh, civil war and we're going to have this. And I just, I, I cringe at the thought that this is the spewing that we're getting rather than lifting our world to God, to you, asking for your mercy, your leadership, not theirs. So as we struggle, Lord, we do it, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Not sure what's going on with the wars in the world, but we know that they continue. We know that the families are suffering loss of family members to an enemy's bullets and bombs. Their homes being destroyed by the same. Many Christians are standing up saying and praying to you 
for mercy, for grace, knowing that you love them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Father, we have many in our own congregation. We've read them to you. We've recapped them, knowing that each one of them are vitally important to you, as we all are. We are truly praising your name that Jeff's daughter got through this without loss. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. And as we think of her, we think of all the emergency responders. We thank you, Father, for the emergency teams that got her through this. We thank you for the police. We thank you for the fire department. All those who go into harm's way are soldiers trying to protect what's theirs, their home, their family, their country. Lord, hear our prayer. Our word in your mercy. <laughs> Father, so many things go through our hearts as we think of what we need in this world. We know you know. And we praise your holy name that we know you know. So, Father, we lift all of these things to you, to your mercy, to your love for us. And we do it knowing that your promises are always true. So we do all of this, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? 
friends. Okay, I guess that we are good. Well, we stand for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he place his countenance upon you and give you his name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.